Um, I'm Alec. Today is August 7th. Just an update about my friend. Her funeral is coming up. And I've been having like really bad dreams. Sometimes it's it's daydreams. And I, I can't tell if it's fake or if it's real. I'll just be sitting at the end of my bed and I'll close my eyes and I can feel her standing at the end of the bed. And I remember looking at her the last time she was alive. And that's, that's not what I see. I see her, her dead. I see what, what I saw at the, the open casket. I see her her gnarled fingers and her eyelids shut. And she's standing there, and she's just sort of swaying back and forth. And her, eyes, her eyes are closed, but she's standing there and it seems it's, it's, it's not a good visit. Seems evil. When I was a kid, I heard about a study, one I'm sure we all remember, that if you write down your goals, you'll be more likely to achieve them. So after watching Jackass and my cousin showing me how to edit clips together, I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. I ripped a sheet out of a journal and popped open a green marker and wrote it down. Become a filmmaker. Then I set it on my desk and I forgot about it. Every morning when I would wake up, I would see it staring at me, yelling at me. Become a filmmaker. Just become it. That yell eventually became a whisper and that whisper eventually just became the fibers in my being. I'd make a lot of jackass style videos and weird little horror shorts, one called Paddle Killer, which there would be three of in the series. But my first film was a documentary about a paranormal team based just one hour north of where I lived in Michigan. Before we go there and watch some of the footage I shot, I wanna look back even further. I wanna look inward too. I wanna look at where the paranormal first came into my life. When I was young, I remember going to an open casket for my great-grandmother. She was dressed up and looked nice, but I could feel there was something off. This was my first brush with death. And when death comes, so do the questions. And my mom always had the answers. Okay, first off, just say your name and your age. Susan Bayless, 47. Okay, first question, or second question, uh, do you believe in ghosts? I'm not sure. So you don't know? You... Um, I, so definitely, you just... I definitely believe that there's, that after you die, that you, that you must go someplace. And like, if you're, if you're not really ready to go, to die, that maybe you're, you're going to go to an in-between between place and you're not. So it could be a ghost. It could possibly. Like a spirit. Uh, yeah. yeah. You, you believe in like spirits walking yes. the earth. Then. Yes. Like that you could be. Like that. Like I feel like someone's presence could be with you. You know, but I think yeah, after you, you go, you like go. Apparitions, some... you know, like shadows and um, like people, like ghost haunting people. No, not really. Or, not really. Or do you believe more in like spirits uh, haunting people? So it could be something else. Um, I believe that you, that you're protected. Like I didn't realize it at the time, no, but seeing this footage sorry, now, she was still before. figuring it out. Um, I feel like... One of the first horror films I ever made was a film called Porter. It was actually a remake of my very first horror film I ever made, but that one is lost forever. Breaking news, this is an emergency. There's a killer on the loose. Lock your doors. Get your children home and safe. If you know anything about the whereabouts, of this killer, please call 911 in the Rockford, Michigan area now. 
I made this movie with two of my friends and my middle brother, Devin. He was always down to help make a movie. My grandma, Jackie, who let us watch horror movies as kids, first indoctrinated my brother, Devin. He was my horror movie shaman. We connected on our love for this genre. Okay, take off the mask and don't move, and then go back to that position. One hand? Yeah, just take off the mask, because you won't see this. Yeah, and drop it, then go that same position, and just sit there. Okay. I think we consciously were trying to make a Halloween slasher, like one of our favorite movie franchises, Halloween. Michael Myers was our anti-hero. Subconsciously, I would say, we were making a movie exploring the potential evils of the world. I have this memory, and it could have been a dream at this point, I can't tell the difference, but in high school, I would get home before my parents and be home alone for a few hours. And sometimes people would pull into our driveway and it was one of those roundabout driveways. And so some people just were using it to turn around and sometimes it was a salesman and some people would come up and knock on the door and I just wouldn't answer. Anyway, I don't know why, but I was very scared of someone breaking in and trying to kill me. Probably all the horror movies. This fear of an unknown man breaking in and hurting me and my family. It was at bay most of the time. But if a stranger would pull up, my chest would fill with fear. I always locked the door. Eventually, my senior year, our house was broken into and we were robbed. I remember coming home with police cars at our house. My mom got home early that day, and she must have come home just moments after the robbers had left. Nobody was hurt, but they'd ransacked our house. It's a hard feeling to express, but it's a mix of confusion, anger, shame, and a sense of broken privacy and vulnerability. I beelined it for my room, and with my personal belongings everywhere, I looked for my camera. The robbers had stolen it. At this moment in my life, I fell to my knees and I cried. Until filmmaking, I didn't have any purpose. I had no real interest in anything else. I enjoyed basketball and other sports, but I never felt the ability to express myself like I could with filmmaking. We'd claim my camera on the insurance and get money to get a new one. It was a Canon Vixia HV40. And it's what I shot Porter with, and it's what I would go on to shoot my ghost documentary on. Um, I believe that you that you're protected, like that I'm protected. Yeah, I'm not as saying far as as far as like everybody that's already gone before me. Um, I feel like there that there was something evil or something good or bad. They wouldn't let anything happen to me, okay. so they would protect me. So I would never, you know, because I don't want. Protect you from I think a ghost or or bad evil, evil right. energy or evil right. spirit. Right, right. I think it, that if you want to be con contacted with the outer world, that you can be, but I choose not to be. Okay. Are you religious? I'm spiritual, yeah. I believe in God. Some things are hard for people to hear, especially when it's the truth. For example, the Bible was not only written by humans, not God, but also originated from the thoughts of humans, not God. As you become an adult and you think for yourself, the answers go away. Doubt becomes clear and faith seems like a distant, blurry idea. As I was going through my old hard drives, looking for the footage from my ghost documentary, I found footage from my early work. Footage of weird, experimental filmmaking. I always remember this, the last thing I, I told him. I said, hang in there. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, you're serious? Fucking lights. It's the fucking lights. I'm 
God is not real. Grass is. Dirt is. <sighs> they are after me. You could see me working out the horror film language, trying to build scenes similar to the ones I saw in my favorite genre. This started in high school with Porter, then I made the ghost documentary, and then I would make a slew of these weird, very weird, short films. The first year I lived in Chicago was with my girlfriend at the time. I made a lot of abstract work, let's call it. Then one of my oldest and best friends moved in with me. This is where my work would expand, even if only slightly. I turned the camera towards him. This is Chris. We've been through a lot together. A lot of it was smoking weed and working shitty restaurant jobs together. Start recording. recording. But a lot of it was also being creative together. Chris is a shy dude, still is to this day. Looking back, I can't believe how much he even got on camera and how much he would say on camera. All right, this is a pitch scene, scene one, take one, clap. We once made a stoner comedy called Buds. It was very much cut from the cloth of our lives at the time. It amazes me seeing us in the short we did called A Night Out, that we were just stoned walking around Chicago at night. Not that that's a scary prospect, especially in Wrigleyville around 2014, but I was a pretty sheltered kid. Before Chris was there, I remember my first days in my first apartment. I would go on walks with my then girlfriend and we would see how far we could get two blocks at first, right. five blocks the next day. We were now in this adult world. Chris? We lived near bars and people would be drunk and partying. Oh. It was kind of shocking <laughs> and a little scary, but mostly it was freeing. You need help, sir? Wait, wait. I think we're good. What the fuck, dude? When Chris moved to Chicago, I felt the world open up even more. Having a friend in the city is a huge advantage. We worked together, we hung out all the time, and we lived in the same apartment. He was an anchor for me. He helped me feel safe, and I'm sure I did the same for him. We made friends together, we made movies together, and I find in life, and in this old footage, that a friend like Chris is something you can't take away. We now live apart, him back in Michigan, myself currently in New York, but I carry the strength he gave me every day when I go into the world. There was this time in elementary school at a talent show. I had these juggling sticks that belonged to my oldest brother, Ryan. Chris was going to help me in the act by catching and tossing them with me. When I got up in front of the school, I didn't toss the sticks to Chris enough. And that's always bothered me because I wouldn't have been up there without him. He's the quiet type and he never brought it up to me. And honestly, he probably didn't even care, but Either way, I appreciate him standing up there with me. And I'm sorry I didn't incorporate him more into the show because he deserved more. I love Chris and he will always be one of my absolute best friends. I'm so happy we got to experience this time period together. I couldn't have done it without him. Every horror movie needs a sidekick and we got to be each other's. What a blast we had. There's something comforting about an old friend Sometimes stories are old friends. Digging through this old footage, I found an interview, similar to my mom's, of my dad. And I asked him to tell me a story that I had heard many times. He's great at telling it, and if you prompt him, he will tell it to you today.
without skipping a beat. Um, do your parents believe in ghosts? Um, my dad, definitely not, I don't think. Um, but I have a story to tell you about that. Yeah, with the, the glass. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Glass. Um, we were uh, up at his house in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, when he had the boat in, out on the lake. And uh, it was like our first, your mother and I's first anniversary. And uh, we spent the day out on the lake. And while we were out there, um, my wedding ring slipped off my finger. So we're, I was swimming, swimming, and uh, my wedding ring, you know, got loose because my finger got cold in the water and, and whatever, and it slid off. And I saw it and I grabbed for it and I couldn't get it and it went to the bottom of the lake. And <clears throat> about five minutes later, your mom was swimming in the water and she had a pair of sunglasses on her head. She swam around and down the sunglasses went. So, you know, I mean, it was a, a bummer about my ring, but when we got back, we were talking about it and Jackie was telling us how Lake LaBelle back at the turn of the century was a famous honeymoon location. Um, common vacation spot and um, so a lot of people in horse and buggy days came up there for the holidays and uh, specifically Lake LaBelle was a very common um, vacation honeymoon kind of spot and Jackie started talking you know about how it was the the ghosts of the lake or you yeah. know the honeymoon ghosts or what sure um, how they took the ring and the glasses as a symbolic gesture on our honeymoon. And uh, it wasn't our honeymoon, it was our anniversary, first year anniversary. And uh, my dad, who's the most pessimistic person I know as far as that kind of thing goes, um, sat there, you know, well, we all kind of stopped and started thinking about it, you know, thinking about the significance of it falling in and all that kind of Is stuff. That yeah, and we all kind of stopped and we're staring off in the space thinking, you know, how you get yeah. kind of deep in thought. Yeah, and everybody everybody did at the same time. And uh, Grandpa, the pessimist, decided he was going to break that up. And he picked up his empty, small wine goblet and he goes, woo, woo, and he started shaking the glass like that. And he goes, Psh, and shattered in his hand. And we said, okay. <laughs> Set the glass down and we all left and went into the room, other room watched TV. What's the, no one said anything after, like, during the TV? No, no I, I mean, as we walked to the other room, we're all going, holy moly, that was <laughs> weird, you know? At 30, death seems more real than ever. It's tangible. It's pain in your knees, pain in your back. I was on an airplane shortly after turning 30, and I play it cool, but I have a little anxiety about flying. It can both put me to sleep and remind me that I can die any minute of any day. I had a moment looking at an older man that I felt the inevitability of death. In that moment, I really feared it. It's more real in your 30s compared to your 20s and your teens. I had experienced it, but I felt disconnected from it then. Death felt more like a concept than something that could actually happen. When I was in high school, some kids committed suicide. That peer-to-peer -peer death experience felt different compared to the death of my great-grandmother. This one felt cut short. One of the kids I had a video class with. He, myself, and two others worked on a PSA against drunk driving. I remember all of us at the edit station watching the one kid edit our piece and I set my big foot down right on a power strip that shut down an entire row of computers and lost the last 15 minutes of work for everybody. I felt like an idiot. But I remember this kid, we can call him Sean. He just laughed. And I appreciated that because everyone else hated me in that moment. That class was closed though, due to the nature of working on video projects together. That class ended after the semester and I would say hi in the hallways or on a basketball court somewhere. I was a junior and he was a senior when he died. 
I remember my mom coming in my room and kind of waking me up with this information that Sean had died. I dry heaved in my bed, almost puking. Shortly after, one of my best friends showed up to my house and we cried and sat together. Regular classes were canceled that day at school, but they put counselors in the gym and the library. I remember people crying that I felt didn't even know him, and that made me think about how well I knew him. Considering I just knew him from a class and sports, I wouldn't consider myself one of his close friends, maybe not even his friend. So I felt like I shouldn't express too much sadness because I didn't want to offend his real friends. Either way, it was so scary, the suddenness of it all. That bright light that would just laugh off my mistake and make me feel better in turn, gone. Later, once I had moved away to college, another girl, this time a year below me, committed suicide. She was similar to Sean in that I was close to her through my class, but I wasn't necessarily in her group of friends. I was a floater in high school. In a lot of ways, I'm a floater in life. I know people, but I'm only truly close with a handful of people, my oldest brother Ryan being one of them. When she died, I took an Amtrak train from Chicago to Grand Rapids, Michigan to go to her funeral. It was sad, as you can imagine. She had an open casket. I refused to go up and see. Sean also had an open casket. That one you couldn't avoid passing, since the casket was set in the lobby as people walked in. I remember seeing his lifeless body, deflated and empty. He was an organ donor. It just makes your heart sink. These two funerals swirled around in my head as I tried to make sense of it as a young person. It would make it into my work in one way or another. Quite literally in the logline of a series I would make called The Holy. The Holy was about a young man who comes home for a funeral to find his sister has been possessed by something paranormal. I raised a thousand bucks for it and I bought a hard drive and some props. Hey, did you see that Chris called? Yeah, I gotta call him back. I'm really happy you're home. Thanks. You know, I'm really sorry about Katie. I'm sorry you have to be home for that. <laughs> Me too. But you know, she's in a better place now. My oldest brother Ryan and I were always close, but he was seven years older than me, and especially as I went from 18 to 22, not in the same place in life as me. I would benefit immensely from the groundwork and learning he did during that time. I had very little experience filmmaking, only my childhood videos, my school projects, and the ghost documentary I did in high school, so I needed his help. Ryan would film the project, his wife at the time would star in it with me as her brother, I would get my brother Devin in the mask used for Porter, and also his girlfriend at the time would play the last character. We shot this in about five days, and it was a blast. There are fewer things more exciting than working on a movie project with people you love who also care about the project. It felt like something. I felt empowered to create. The project ended up too short for a feature film, but Ryan and his friend Darren would cut it together in very stylistic episodes, which ended up being its best form. I go and watch that project today and I still love it. It's weird, very loose, and very style heavy. But it was me working out something in life through the lens of horror filmmaking. Something I'm very scared of is just being a regular person, of not reaching my goals and not doing something special in life. I've always felt destined for greatness, silly as it sounds, but it's my biggest weakness, but also one of my biggest strengths. It gets me up to bat again and again as I fail throughout life, because failure is progress and progress is success. My mom always made us three boys feel special. It's something we carry with us. Here's my mom reading a note she wrote me on her yearly book she gives us at Christmas. One, two, out. Um, my, our youngest. Oh. Come on, I want to hear it. 
Come on, I wanna hear I wanna hear that from you. This will be so great one day. Okay, see you later. Wait, look at me though. Read it to me. <laughs> my my our youngest of the Bayless boys. You have shown amazing growth this year. <laughs> Come on, I love it. Oh, I can't do this, Dad. Don't don't film me. Okay, this year. You have gone from being a young man to a young adult, being faced with all kinds of decisions in life, paying, paying bills, trying to figure out what you what you want to do with your life. Um. <laughs> oh, it's okay, Mom. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is so embarrassing. Put that thing on my face. Okay. Okay. Make sure we go back. Being a young man to a young adult, being faced with all kinds of decisions, making paying bills, trying to figure out what you want to do in life, with your life. Alec, you know what you want. <laughs> Why are you laughing and crying? Oh, this is embarrassing. Okay. Alec, you know what to do. You know what you want. You, you know what you want. Okay. You make me nervous. Alec, you know what you want. Just have, you just have to make a decision. To make it happen. My best advice to you is to just stay true to yourself and enjoy and enjoy every moment. Enjoy the moments life presents to you. So Betty kissing Santa Claus. Thanks, Mom. I, I love appreciate you always. God bless you, Mama. Thanks, I appreciate that. <laughs> really good. Yeah, you could. You should like, right, we need to practice a little bit first. Practice? No, it's supposed to be real. You want, you want, you want. Okay. Mom, I love you. I gotta get another. It's a bit simple. Right. Um, I built you know, my group, and I have that built grasp up. The, the three founders are my wife and my best friend. Uh huh. And we built this thing up from nothing, and, and we're pretty uh pretty well known in this area now. And our our name is is you know, our image, and it's, it's something that we all value, and we all try to protect quite well. Right. Oh, I w right, right. I first heard of GRASP on a paranormal message board. Gathering research and stories of paranormal phenomenon was what it stood for. After a few emails, I had that call with the founder, Bill. The making of this film would be my first real foray into documentary filmmaking. I would make every mistake, from not having enough batteries to not filming important moments because I didn't realize when they were happening. But I did get enough footage I believe, to give a viewer a glimpse into the grasp world, into the lives of Bill and Connie and crew. After our awkward call, I would drive up to meet them for the first time. Do you believe in spirits or demons? Like, you know how the paranormal activity, for example, like they talk more about demons and how she's possessed. Do you believe someone could get possessed by something like that or is that, no? No, I think that the mind is a very powerful, powerful tool. You have the ability to go to very far extremes of what we think of as somebody being normal, right? Mm -hmm. And you understand normal because you see the extremes. Yeah. You see way wacky, you see, you know, way mean, nasty. And you know somewhere in between is normal range. Yeah. Well, have you ever been ghost hunting? No. no that's good. Do you believe in spirits and demons? Yes. Demons like uh, bad, bad energy. Things. No, like, well, yeah, but uh, a demon I, that could possess you. Yes. Then it could. So exorcism, you would, you believe in that? I, I, I would say I, I'm not gonna say yes to that. I'm gonna say it could happen. You know, when I told when I told you, yes, you when good. you decided to make this documentary, I told you that. Um, 
you know, you got to be careful. And when I say when I say that, you I don't mean, bring bad energy. Back. Right. I get Bill, Connie, and Jay welcomed me with open arms. They were kind, enthusiastic, and confident. I filmed them at an Elks Lodge in Grand Haven, Michigan. They gave me a tour and told me about ghostly happenings that occurred around the building. Uh, I don't remember what holiday that was. Mm -hmm. It might have been the 4th of July last year. Was it the 4th of July last year? What's that? Was it the 4th of July or was it Coast Guard? Coast Guard. Coast Guard. Okay. Uh, the kid was like misbehaving, let's just say. <laughs> and so they gave him a timeout and there's like a couch right inside there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there was like a... That's where he was sat. There was like oh. three or four adults out here talking. They were standing over here. Okay, over here. And then all of a sudden they're like... They heard the kid yelling, right? Yelling? Yep. Heard him so, yelling and howling. So they thought he was like in here. So the one guy, he goes over here like this. And he's like, he's like looking in the window. Yeah. Like trying to see the kids. And then all of a sudden he looks down and the kid's down here. How do you get in there? <laughs> There's only one way you can get in there and you got to lift that gate. Is that heavy? Very heavy. About 100 pounds. So There's, there's no, no way, way a five-year-old's going to lift no a 100 pound gate. There's no way you're going to lift this. Climb down in there and put it back down without getting hurt or scratched up. Right. Not to mention that the only way to get to it is to come out this door and yep. go there. You cannot you go can't. through it through the box, through inside. Uh -huh. So now we weren't able to find anything to prove it actually happened. Right. Yeah. But we have plenty of witnesses that say they were standing right here when it happened. When it happened. I set them up for an interview in a large echoey room. Sure. I put them all three on camera at once, which I would do differently now, but hey, I was learning and we spoke about everything paranormal. <laughs> All right, let's start off by asking, what do you guys do? They explain, um, we are paranormal investigators. We find areas where people think there's paranormal. Activity. Bill goes on to explain what a paranormal investigator does. But what I see in this moment is something profound. I'll play it again. When I asked them what they do, Bill answers, paranormal investigators. And Jay, his best friend, and a member of the paranormal team smiles and looks at Bill lovingly, giving an approving nod. Bill was at the time, and still may be, a truck driver. I'm not sure what Connie or Jay did, but I'm sure they had jobs outside of paranormal investigations as well. In this moment, looking back, I admire Bill's bravery. He's out in the world announcing himself as a paranormal investigator even though what makes him money is truck driving, something entirely different. At this time in my life, I felt like a phony calling myself filmmaker, since I barely made anything. And of that work, it shouldn't be taken seriously. It took me a very long time to feel comfortable calling myself a filmmaker. I always thought, even once I do something other people validate as a film, then that's when I can call myself that. Even though, here I was, making a film, being a filmmaker. Because what I didn't know was when I was young and first wrote that goal down, that simply by pushing record on my digital camera, filming clips with my friends, editing them, and then showing whatever audience I could find, was being a filmmaker. We had a few up there in Cadillac where the cameras, the voice recorders were shut off, and people were in the room doing an investigation. Uh, we lost like 45 minutes of YouTube when you had your uh -huh. little incident. Hey, yeah. I set the equipment up. I, I, no, I'm not placed. No, I'm not placing no, blame. This is, we got this is just a reminder. Oh, no, that was good at me, too. I can defend myself <laughs> there. You know, we still got audio of that, in, of that situation. We got the handheld on it. But we lost major. the video that showed her having a personal experience. This is the main. After leaving the Elks, I visited Bill and Connie's home. They had all the cases and evidence stored on their home computer. Bill walked me through a series of photos, some with things that could be explained, and some photos with potential evidence for the paranormal. He was passionate about this. He showed me books and showed me their gear and told me stories. What I loved the most about his passion was that it was admired and it was contagious. 
the way Jay would look at Bill when he would make a point with authority, or the way Connie would add in little bits and pieces to fill in Bill's story. They were best friends, and they created this group together for fun. But it turned into something more. This passion and platform drew more people in. It built a small community, and that was something I admire. Bill had made more out of his life, out of passion and action. He gave himself and his friends a platform where they were the authority, a place to call the shots, a place to be together and have fun, and most importantly to Bill, a place that they could help people. You want to help them, right? Yeah, that's where he helped. We were with the Elks here. We were asked to come in because they had strange sounds and noises, things happening that they didn't understand. And we came in and investigated it and found things that we couldn't understand. Now and you, the goal is basically to figure out what it is. Tour, and we, we, uh, we came through over there. Okay, came back around back. And we went downstairs. I was in the front, and then we had a group, and she was she was in the end. So as she was coming through the outside door, she goes, she she yelled to me, and said she heard a door slam. All right, so I'm like, wow, cool. Mm -hmm. so I almost told told the group to stay, but then they followed us anyways. <laughs> we came we came running back up up the stairs. We came running back up the stairs, and then we came down. I came down here. And I'm like looking. This door was open. So there was no light on in there. I come back, back by, by here. I looked at this door. It was closed. You could see under under the door. There's a little gap. I didn't see a light on it. Mm -hmm. I came over here. I checked this door. I checked inside here. Everything was good. Then I went back and I could see a light on it. As Jay is telling me this story about strange things happening at the Elks Lodge, I notice Bill in the background looking fondly at his friend telling the story. I'm like, okay, who left the light on? We weren't supposed to have any lights on. What also must have been satisfying was seeing the actualization of the thing he has manifested. But I also think he's happy because he loves the paranormal and he loves discussing it. Okay, if the light was on and you knew about it, why didn't you turn it off? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. why didn't it get turned off? And, I, and I'm swearing, I'm saying no. That light was off when I went that way. Two seconds later, when I came back, it was on. Sometimes it felt like they were grasping at straws, ready to believe whatever they needed to, to prove the existence of the paranormal and to perpetuate the world they created. I also think that a core aspect of being a human being is believing in something outside of yourself. I would consider myself an atheist, but there's a nugget of my soul that is afraid, afraid of ghosts, afraid of a God, afraid of the unknown. Am I a believer, whether I like it or not? Mm -hmm. Things that conduct paranormal energy are running waters, uh, minerals such as granite. They're very, <laughs> they're, they're said to be very strong fields that can be created by these things. We're 200 yards from a river these granite plaques, there's numerous plaques around here, granite and stuff. These are all lists of fallen members. Back in the early 1900s, there was a mineral, magnetic mineral springs across the street. You know, so these are all things that can add to the energy of it. The mist wrapping around the tree mm -hmm. that we were talking about. If it were breath, because of somebody taking and holding the camera wrong, yeah, it would be deep around the edges somewhere where it was coming in. Now, we're, we come in here all the time, and when we first started coming in here, people were jokingly, all oh, the ghost hunters, the ghost busters, <laughs> you know? Ghost and once they started looking at the things that we found, they take us a little more seriously. A few weeks later, I would make my way back to Grand Haven and go on an investigation with them. A woman and her daughter were experiencing paranormal phenomenon in their rental unit. It's a house about the size of our living room. He said Boston. What? That was plural. Yes. No, it's bigger than that. It's not much bigger than that. It's bigger than that. 
on that case in Spring Lake. So I could do the investigation from outside? Just holler yeah, into just the house? Yeah, just your head, your hand. You won't even have to holler. Yeah, with the camera <laughs> or the mic, or, you know, the... Well, they're you can reach over and tap us. There goes the door trying open. the walkie-talkies, because you just talk and you hear each other. Exactly. Outside. Exactly. Okay, so you're not going to tell us anything about this house, here's, right? Here's what I'm going to tell you about this investigation. Big mouth on there. Mm -hmm. everywhere. It's all about me. Bill Jones of Graft yeah. presents. <laughs> Make sure you put it in pink. <laughs> After a brief introduction to Sean and Ella, we shut off all the lights and began the investigation. The EMF is went from being a 0 0.02 to a 0 0.08, 0 0.09, Just 0 0.10. Up. Yep, I ain't moving at 0 0.09. It has been at 0 0.03 the entire time, and now it's 0 0.9. The hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Can you come in the bathroom with me? I'd like to talk to you, too. Can you, can you see this on your camera? Mm -hmm. It's now 0 0.08. Are you looking at me right now? I'm freaking being watched other than if I can <laughs> Don't let them scare you. Has someone died in this house? Fire lands on me, I will scream and bolt and probably knock you over. Just so you know. Okay. Okay. If I see one, I'll tell you to move. But I'm gonna hold, make sure the door doesn't. After the investigation, we had a post-mortem in the living room. Did you and Nancy have any experiences or anything nope. happen? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. We took the information that you told us when you came out and I discussed it with Sean and Ella and Connie and I. The four of us are the only four 
that knew anything about the goings on. Okay, and Sean's gonna let you two know, especially you two, but all of us, what some of the things are going on here. And I want you guys to compare what she tells you with the things you were telling us. My first experience with anything in this house, um, I was in her bedroom cleaning off her dresser and coming from that direction to this direction, I saw a shadow sort of a something out of the corner of my eye that like double take type of thing and I knew it was a man um, and that's really all I could discern from from that moment and I talked to my landlord and I asked him his dad actually he was his dad grew up in this house so and his dad died in this house and I don't know his name but I called my landlord and asked him, you know, do you know anybody, if anybody died in this house? Because I think there's something here. And he said, well, my dad did. And he, I said, well, maybe it's him. And he, he just said, well, tell him I said hi. They and their family, and the women in their family, have all had psychic experiences. Do you know what his name is? We are going Dane. to find that out. D-A-A-N-E. Dane? Dane. I know his last name is Dane. I think it's curiosity. Not trying to bother you. Just so, curiosity. Bother, you know. The negative? You no don't, negative. You don't there's feel a little, any negative. There's a, there was a little bit of intimidation. A little bit, but I and the response is almost like out of curiosity. Like, no way harmful. No, not necessarily negative. I don't know how to explain it, but I would just curious. Like there's curiosity. Maybe that's <laughs> what I would say if I felt anything when I saw it from Ella's bedroom. Well, now where, where you were standing out there, and where was it? Exactly. Well, the first time was, I was standing here dusting. And it was right there. Can you reach? <laughs> Can you reach? <laughs> if I'm if I'm him, this is me. Okay, so I'm... Sean and Ella would continue to share more occurrences they experienced in the rental. I don't want to invalidate what they experienced, but it became apparent to me that many of the things that happened there were as shadows or in the corner of their eye. And I do believe them. I think they experienced something. I'm just not sure what. I also see a mom and her daughter in a rental house looking for a way to connect a community to be a part of, someone to talk to. Sometimes by creating an experience, fact or fiction, we give ourselves a reason to join together. Individuals creating reasons to interact with each other. I think that's the same reason Grasp was there. And I know it's the same reason I was there. More than anything, working on a film or a project is the best way I know how to connect. And I can see myself here believing or not, trying to connect with other people. Connection and community can beat the honest to God truth any day of the week. Well, I was, I was sitting in the bathroom, you okay? Yeah. <laughs> I was sitting in the bathroom and I had this just really sad feeling that and it, I just felt that it was a little boy. And Lindsay's the one that said with long blonde hair, it, he looks like a girl, but it's a boy. And to me, this is just what I feel, is that, and I'm starting to get goosebumps, he's looking for a family and he found one. So. She I saw it. I told you we didn't yeah. get it on camera, right. but you'll see yeah. me jump you, up you, you and I get tears. My eyes get watery and you'll see me in the tape wiping my eyes. Cause they, and I even say, I said, oh my God, my eyes are watering. But what we did didn't, see? It's a, it was a shadow, what a distinct it? shadow. It was by that lamp. Behind the, 
lamp. We had a camera corner. on a stool maybe pointing towards like the cubby hole and she was sitting on your bed with the camera and I was next to her and I saw it and I jumped up and I said, oh my God, there's something right there. So we didn't get anything on camera, oh but I saw it and I know it was a man. Really? Yes, a little boy. Like the more I'm thinking about it and I'm in here, I don't feel like he's part of the property. I think there's something in your house that he's linked to. Uh, object. I, yeah. As to where the man, I think the man's linked to literally to the property, but okay. one of the other is not, and I don't, I don't know why. But the painting upstairs, I wouldn't, not out of intimidation or scariness, I wouldn't leave it there, and I think it's a comfort thing that it's there. Well, you've seen something grab. I saw a shadow, and it may or may not be on tape because I did hand it to her. I think it might be because you, you saw it, it on a video. That was almost like an arm reaching out. And because you handed the camera to me after you saw that. Yeah, because I got closer to the painting because I wanted to see what the painting was. Sometimes we chase a feeling, and that can be dangerous. Our emotions don't always point us in the right direction. But logic isn't the only way to live life. It must work in tandem with your heart and how you feel. This balancing act of logic and emotions is what a paranormal investigator must succeed at to uncover the truth. Yeah. All right, I think we're gonna wrap this up and we're gonna get out of your hair and give you your house back. Okay. You know, be sure. Earlier, the two investigators had found a painting in the attic. Now what happens next, you'll have to decide for yourself whether it was coincidence or guidance from something else. I'm gonna go up and look in that crawl space. Sure, let's do that. I just wanna do it while you're still here. I wanna, I wanna see it. So, okay. Now, it's dusty in there, there's cardboard on the part. You big brew? Shut up. Wait, what is it? Caroline Bays. <gasps> look at that. Oops. Wow. And now that you look at it up close, it is dusty. Yeah. I would have expected a lot more. It has been. It has mounting on the back, and it has. You got a picture of that? For dad. For dad. Wait. Oh, what? That's 65. Why, that's Wait. Can you keep it there? I want it to get, go away. I bet. Oh my it was dad. a gift for dad. For dad. Now, you throw everything together. Oh, I did get goosebumps. Look at my arm. No. Me, I'm still sweating over here, man. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta crawl back in there. My hands all dirty now, cobwebs. No pictures of my ass. We're going down. And that I found upside down one day, and I thought maybe you did it. <laughs> Do you remember me saying that about yes. the little blue truck? Yes, you did. You <laughs> set it out in the van. It's attracted to that little blue truck. Yeah, she told me that one. You're losing. They were in the van. <laughs> yeah, I found, You're telling me. <laughs> This one day was I going was upside thing. down over here, and I thought, oh, well, Ella did that. Yeah, she being just played left it, you know? On the way back, we stopped at a gas station, still shaking from the excitement of the investigation. I wish I could have captured this, this afterglow from the investigation. It was really palpable. And in these uncaptured moments, I really understood why they were chasing the paranormal. Bill dropped me off in my car, said goodbye to the team, and drove home. I am getting tons of requests for a fundraiser. I uh, need help from everybody in the team because this idea will require money up front. I already told you what I was going to do. Those that contribute to this we get will get their <laughs> we'll get their money back as soon as things are collected. 
That's a good one. Yes, you will get a t-shirt. That's because, like, at work, it's see here. Here's 200 bucks to help out. Here's a damn t-shirt. There, there is a, there is a <laughs> possibility. Yeah, what, what I'm talking about is this. It's going to be a ghost tour. Um, I have a lot of things to get set up. Right now, for 100 t-shirts, it's looking like $500. I'm trying to get better prices. We all want more from life. Something beyond death. Some meaning that feels special. We need purpose. I make things. When I look back at my work, horror or documentary, I see a common thread. I wanted to break free from my mundane job or my low income or the fact that I'm just a regular person with nothing special about them. The Grand Haven Ghost Tour 2010. In October of that year, Grasp decided to host a ghost tour in the town of Grand Haven. They got the shirts made, the buses rented, and a million dollars worth of insurance. Due to some confusion we had during the uh, process of telling people about this, there are seven people that bought tickets online. They will get their free t-shirts. The next 87 people in the door beside them, three, three, three people. In the door, we'll get free t-shirts. Get them back. Get them back, damn it. I have my shoes on, ain't no fun. So basically what we're doing is the first 90 people in the door are gonna get free t-shirts. I outwardly express to others that I'm regular. It's like getting ahead of the school bully by being self-deprecating. But deep down, I feel special. I feel like what I have to say can matter. I want to change the world. I want to be better and bigger than I am. And the team at Grasp wants the same thing. We want more. No, no. Bill guided the first group through a tour of the Elks basement. He spoke of the equipment they used and some of the experience they've had at the Elks. The turnout was much lower than expected. I feared that the money for the t-shirts wouldn't be recouped during this inaugural year. That made me feel sad, considering the work they had put into it. The event itself, in all honesty, was a little bit disorganized, unrehearsed, and boring for large portions. Some of the tour guests were pretty intoxicated and kept talking over the different hosts. But one thing I understand now is that they had to start somewhere and they could make improvements as they built something. Sometimes starting is half the battle. But here are my heroes, bombing on stage, happy as can be, knowing that they are brave enough to get up there in the first place. We train here at the Elk. Do your parents believe in ghosts? Or does your, your dad? No, I don't think did so. Did your mom before she mm -hmm. did? Yeah. My mom one time said that she, after her, um, it was Father's Day, it was a Sunday, we had gone out to visit her, my dad's father's grave, because he had died. And we went out there to visit, you know, we were really busy and stuff, and we went out there to go visit his grave. It was on Sunday, it was raining out stuff, and nobody really wanted to go, but she said, you know, Jim, let's go. It's Father's Day. We should go put that arrangement on your father's grave. We went out there and we did that and everything. We came home and um, I went to the store with my dad and Mark went someplace and Mark, your brother. And my brother, my mom was sitting at the kit. She was at the sink doing dishes and she said she felt like um, 
she told me this years later that she she said she felt my grandpa's presence behind her. Mm -hmm. He was. She said she knew exactly where he was standing. He was standing on the rug, in the kitchen, and he was standing there. And he said he he said to her in like telepathy sort of um, that um, they, he thanked her for being there for coming on a on a day that it was kind of rainy and stuff. He thanked her for for that to thinking thinking of him and um, just being there. And so I think she sort of believed in that kind of stuff. I think she had the I think she had the um, the ability to to communicate maybe, but she so chose not to. Medium. Yeah, she's kind of like me. I, I think I have the ability to, to to communicate if I wanted to, but I don't. What would you what would validate the reality of ghosts? Um, if I really saw one. Yeah, I mean, you just I, I've seen things. I've seen I've seen a few things in my life that are like questionable, but I don't like I don't want anything to do with it. Uh -huh. And so I say so I say what, what I say to seen? my um, one time I was walking, and I was walking downstairs here at this house, uh -huh. and I was I was actually sitting downstairs. It was late at night, and I was watching a movie down there, and I, I decided to by the door. No. Oh, I am. Um, came upstairs and when I came upstairs right as the, and, and it was dark down there because mm -hmm. you know I shut the TV off and I was walking and you know the doorway into the room yeah I was walking out there and something walked by me like a, I could feel it I could feel the wind like and I went what was that and then I, then I thought about it later on this made more sense the mirror was right there do you know what I mean? Yeah. The mirror and what could have happened is I could have like gone. I was walking kind of fast, and that was through the wind. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw the reflect. It could have been my re my own reflection in the mirror, and that's what I saw. Okay. <clears throat> but it was it gave me like a chill feeling for a second, but it wasn't a bad feeling. I know if there's bad energy around me. Right. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing expecting a different result. And here I am, perpetuating the overuse of a good intro sentence to a paragraph, making another movie about ghosts, and here I am, expecting to gain new perspective, or to tell a new story. Expecting for my fridge to have something in it that wasn't there a second ago. What I think keeps me going, keeps us going, is that maybe one time, magic or circumstance, you did open the fridge, and you did find something new that wasn't there before. And that little bit of magic, or paranormal, or mystery, did happen, and you can't explain it, and people won't believe you. But you know what you saw, and it's that thing, that inkling of something not tangible or scientifically explained, that can propel us forward. To me, it's exciting. In a world where all the corners of Earth are being documented, filmed, and shared in an instant, there will always be a little mystery left. So I'm left with one question. Does it matter if it's real or not? Thank you.